This meeting is being recorded. Dear colleagues, uh, dear participants, my name is Roman. I'm a project coordinator at the Center for Civil Liberties, a Kyiv-based think tank. And today, in a framework of our uh, joint project with Abarolio, American Bar Association Rule of Law project promoting internet freedom in Ukraine, we conduct a series of webinars on various topics on media law, ICT law, uh, cybersecurity, and related topics. Our other webinars available on our YouTube channel, and I will share you the link in the chat. Today, we uh, have a conversation with digital security expert, Mr. Uh, Dmitry Vitaliev. He is the founder and the director of organization called Equality, an organization dedicated to preserving and protecting human rights on the internet. Also, Equality creates uh, the decentralized internet services in support of more equal and uh, accessible uh, networks. And uh, Dmitry will uh, be able to share with you these cutting edge technologies. Today at the webinar, we will also learn about three types of censorship on the internet. We will speak about uh, DDoS attacks, uh, website censorship, and internet disconnections as a tool that authoritarian regimes use against its uh, people. Also, it is worth mentioning that Ukraine is currently facing Russian military invasion, and this war happening not only in the battlefields, but also in the digital world. Ukrainian civil security networks um, are constantly attacked by Russian uh, Federation hackers or by groups associated to Russian Federation. That's why uh, building your understanding of cybersecurity is important not only for, for uh, gover governmental organization, but also for NGOs and for ordinary uh, citizens. If you have question during the presentation, please uh, type them in the chat and at the end we will be able to uh, go through them. And it is my pleasure to uh, give a word to uh, Dmitry. The floor is yours. I will share your presentation now. Okay, thank you very much, Roman. Um, yes, good afternoon or oh, good evening, early evening, I guess in Ukraine now. Um, yes, my name is Dimitri. I am uh, from Equality. Equality is a Canadian-based organization. I'm sitting now in Montreal. And uh, the next 45 minutes or an hour or so, I would like to dedicate to describing various forms of um, support that Equality provides, particularly to Ukrainian civil society in this instance. Um, support for high risk digital security or digital insecurity events. Um, I think it's important to mention from the beginning that this is a, a seminar for you. I would like to make sure that I can deliver this information in a way that is understandable to you, in a way that is practical to you. So please, uh, if you have any questions as I'm going along at any time, please post them in the chat. It's very important that, for, for me, it's very important that uh, you understand the scope of this presentation. Um, we've been operating for about uh, 12 years. Our focus is on developing security solutions to defend human rights on the internet. And as of the last uh, two, three years or so, we are also making a strong uh, move towards decentralized internet services. And I think as we go through this presentation, you will get a better understanding as to why, how we feel decentralization uh, blends or is in parallel to our ambitions um, to protect human rights on the internet. Um, Raman is gonna be controlling the slides for me. So Raman, next slide, please. Um, so 
obviously a lot has changed for you um, in the last year and uh, a lot has changed for equality as well. We have uh, reorientated a lot of our programming to help uh, Ukrainian citizens, Ukrainian defenses, Ukrainian civil society during this difficult time. Um, we are operating with many partners on the ground, uh, but primarily a lot of our activities are being done in conjunction with Internews Ukraine, who has been a partner of ours uh, for over 10 years now. I think it's also important to say that all of the technology and services that Equality is offering at the moment to Ukraine comes uh, free of charge. Um, and we have removed since the beginning of the war, the notion that our services are free only to civil society. Our services are currently free and will continue to be free in their entirety to all Ukrainian citizens and business. Next slide, please. Um, one of the things I'd like to mention in the beginning, uh, particularly as it might be useful to you after this webinar, uh, is the project that we stood up together with Internews Ukraine called Nadino. Um, this is a digital security helpline. You can contact them by email, Telegram, WhatsApp, Signal, uh, web chats as well, with any question on digital security, whether it comes from the material in this presentation or for any other purpose. And there's about a dozen operators who are continuously working um, to answer all incoming questions. Um, so please be aware, this is also a free service um, it is built uh, with support from um, the Canadian government and uh, it will continue functioning, uh, well, hopefully permanently. Uh, Nidino.org is the way to access the service. Okay, Raman, next slide, please. So, I'm going to be talking to you about three of our projects, um, Deflect, Sino, and Decoms. Now, all three of these projects are built to battle with one of the, as I say, three chimeras, three-headed chimera of internet censorship. Uh, all of these projects are built in mind of protecting um, Article 19 and 20 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And uh, at the end of the presentation, you will have links to these projects so that you too can try them out yourself. Okay, I'm going to be starting with Deflect. So Deflect is an infrastructure uh, we have designed, built and continue to maintain since 2011. The point of Deflect is to stop various cyber attacks, primarily distributed denial of service or DDoS attacks against our clients' websites. DDoS is used as a form of censorship on the internet, meaning that if you want to shut somebody up, so to speak, there are several ways to do it, one of which is to knock their server off the internet, to attack it, in such a way that it is not able to handle all the incoming requests and it falls over. Now, this has been used as a very uh, common mechanism to censor the websites of independent media, civil society, human rights investigators, so on and so forth. Sometimes these attacks are launched by nation states, but quite often they are launched by cyber offensive teams, or simply anybody with a credit card really can find a sort of a company ready to DDoS anybody 
uh, of their request if they pay. So Deflect has been stood up in 2011 to protect websites against these types of attacks. Next slide, please. Um, we protect it against all sorts of technical attacks. Um, we also protect our clients from various social engineering attacks. Um, sometimes a DDoS attack is launched as a distraction to another type of attack or the other way around. The social engineering attack is launched as a distraction to the DDoS attack. And uh, quite often we also protect our clients against various types of legal attacks. Uh, legal attacks too can be a form of social engineering. And yeah, over the last 12 years, I think we've faced all sorts of different attacks and have quite a lot of experience in how to protect our clients against all of them. Next slide, please. So yeah, just uh, basic statistics. Um, there's about a million people that go through the network every day. Um, as you can see, and particularly since the concentration of our efforts in Ukraine, quite a lot of Ukrainian websites and more importantly, Ukrainian citizens are reading websites under our protection. More often than not, uh, Ukrainians constitute more than 50% of all the global readership of deeply protected websites. Next slide. Yeah, and there's about a thousand organizations uh, on our, under our protection at the moment, uh, coming from all around the world. Um, as I said earlier, um, Deflect is a free service for qualifying organizations uh, who themselves have to be not-for-profit and coming from civil society. Uh, but at the moment, uh, that particular restriction does not apply to Ukrainian websites. We are welcoming all Ukrainian websites. Next slide. Just briefly, uh, what does it look like, this deflect uh, service? Well, basically, it's quite similar to another service you might be aware of called Cloudflare. Um, you register your website on deflect.ca. After that, you change your DNS settings to point to us, after which all traffic bound for your website goes through our network first. We have a network in about 20 locations around the world. Um, and it is a network that is built to be resilient. Uh, inside the Flect, you also have the possibility of not only of protecting your website, but also of hosting it there. If your website runs on WordPress, we also offer secure and managed WordPress hosting. Uh, there's multilingual support, also in Ukrainian. And uh, for about the last three years, uh, we've had quite efficient um, machine learning, or sometimes as known artificial intelligence, um, running to ensure that mitigation is working 24-7. And next slide. Um, on the screen in front of you is an example of what an attack looks like. Uh, there were several attacks uh, in this use case against the Zhutomir Info uh, media website. Not only do we stop these attacks, but we can also help analyze them. So not necessarily just getting the metadata of an attack, but actually beginning to look into who is behind this attack. What kind of methods are they using? What kind of infrastructure are they using? And who might actually be behind the driving seat of that attack? We publish these reports on our website. They get picked up by media. And uh, usually it's quite an effective way to turn a negative situation of a DDoS attack against your website into a positive situation of your website still standing up 
and getting a lot more readership because you are publishing investigations about an attack. So this is Deflect. Deflect.ca is how you get registered and how you start protection for your website. And the second head of the Chimera is website censorship. Now, this periodically in Ukrainian internet and legislative history had been an issue now and again. Um, obviously, with a, a part of Ukraine now temporarily occupied, um, people living in those areas are finding their internet to be rerouted to the Russian internet, to the RUNET. And with that, they are also behind the various surveillance and the various censorship mechanisms of uh, the Russian state as implemented by Roskomnadzor. So it is important for you to understand how the various types of censorship, how to get around censorship, um, and then how to teach others, how how to communicate with people in occupied areas and how to teach them about getting around censorship as well. Now, you've all heard of VPNs and are probably using them now. I think most of you know by now uh, how to get around simple internet censorship. So we're going to concentrate on more complicated forms of internet censorship. The more complicated forms constitute not only the blocking of websites, but blocking of many internet resources, including blocking of methods like VPNs to help you get around these restrictions. So in some circles, this is beginning to be known as internet shutdowns. When uh, WhatsApp and Telegram are blocked, you know, in some circles, this is known as an internet shutdown. So if you were to implement something effective like that to make sure that people cannot communicate with each other and people cannot get around your restrictions, you would begin to censor um, not only websites themselves, but like I mentioned, hosting providers, large um, internet cloud systems like Microsoft, Google, Amazon. You would also censor VPNs, so on and so forth. Now, unfortunately, we're starting to see a lot more of this happening, um, happening in your region as well, in Belarus, in Kazakhstan, in Russia periodically. And uh, what is it that one can do when VPNs begin to be blocked, what else is left? So Equality has been working on a solution for the last um, five years now in, in a project called Censorship No. Next slide, please. Censorship No, one of its ambitions is to create the next generation of censorship circumvention technology something that remains standing when uh, VPNs and other proxies are, are no longer working. One of its outputs is the Sino browser. So the Sino browser we have uh, developed uh, and released and continue to support. And uh, I'm going to explain to you how it works and what makes it special. Next slide. So it is the world's first mobile browser that is actually using torrents as the underlying technology. Uh, torrents, you might remember, or you might know from the world of BitTorrent or WebTorrent. This is a different protocol that has been very useful for file sharing. Now we have adopted this protocol and built it inside a browser. 
meaning that every user on our network is also a node on the BitTorrent network. And we are using the BitTorrent protocol for people to get to websites that they want to go, but then also to share the content that they have already received with other Sino users. Because as you recall, you know, BitTorrent protocol is for sharing. So we decided to build a browser on top of these protocols. Um, and if we go to the next slide, I will show you how it is more resilient than VPNs and other uh, solutions. So because every Sino user becomes an active node inside the network, you are also helping other people using Sino who are behind censorship get around that censorship. So we have as many proxy servers as we have users. You know, at any one moment, there's a hundred thousand plus users on the network and each one of those users can help you. Or in other words, you can also help each one of these users simply by running Sino on your phone. If you are living in an area that does not practice heavy censorship, then people living in other areas where there is heavy censorship can connect to the internet through you. So this is kind of mutually beneficial web browsing. And I think this makes the network very strong and very resilient. Next slide. Now, the other advantage, as I mentioned, and we'll go into a little bit more detail now, is that once content has been retrieved on your phone, for example, you have opened up the website of uh, Pravda.com UA, the next person in this network who is asking for the same website can then get it from you. They don't need to go outside of their network anymore. Once content is inside the network, is inside people's phones, it can continue to propagate among them using BitTorrent's peer-to-peer -peer protocol. Now, the good thing for you is that you don't really need to understand how any of this works. I mean, it's always good if you understand. Uh, it will also give you uh, a better understanding of inherent opportunities and risks. Uh, but by and large, you install this in a browser. It looks like a normal browser. And you just start browsing websites, whether these websites have come through connecting via my telephone in Canada or whether that website has come simply from another person in your town who has already visited this website. It doesn't really degrade the experience for you. It also gives us opportunities to reach people during complete internet isolation. And that is the third head of the Chimera that I want to talk to you about, complete internet disconnections. So let's start in the bottom right-hand corner where you have, well, a slightly um, let's say historical and hopefully also a uh, future-proof network map of Ukraine. Now, initially, um, in February, um, we, in early February, we were thinking about, you know, how we can be useful in a situation, how our knowledge can be useful in a situation where military activity would damage cables connecting Ukrainian cities to one another and connecting them to the rest of the internet. You see, a shutdown can happen by several different ways. Yes, it can happen through the 
severing of internet cables. You know, the internet is a network of networks uh, and it kind of just works magically um, by the ability of packets to route themselves from your building, neighborhood, town, region, country to the server that you want to go to and back to you, you know, everything in milliseconds. But all of this potential, at least the way we use it now, is lost when your network becomes disconnected from other networks. So military activity, earthquakes, as we see in Turkey now as well, force majeure can be one cause of an internet shutdown. But uh, more often than not, it is actually government activity that is behind this connection. Um, the organization Access Now has been recording instances of shutdowns. They have a slightly broader definition of a shutdown. It, it, it is more akin to the second head of the Himera that I was talking to um, and have recorded, you know, over a uh, hundred incidents of shutdowns um, last year and last year in 35 different countries. So when there is a shutdown, next slide, please. and your network is disconnected, there is no more, not yet, please. There is no more way to get around that, initially speaking. There's no VPN server uh, you can connect to because there's no network outside of yours. You cannot connect from my Sino client on my phone in Canada again because we need the network in order to do any sort of clever routing. We still need the network to be there. If there is no network to be there, what is it that you're left with? What are your options then? Now, this all depends on the size of the network that has been disconnected. Because again, in the Ukrainian case, sometimes we had small towns being disconnected. Sometimes we had cities being disconnected. Um, for the last several years, uh, Russia has been passing all sorts of legislative uh, bills and testing all sorts of technical infrastructure in order to disconnect the entire country from the rest of the internet. What has been colloquially called Chibernet. Now, should this happen, and should it happen soon, it will, by its nature, include the disconnection of the occupied territories from the rest of the internet. So what Opportunities remain in this scenario. Next slide, please. Basically, what we need to do is look at technology that can work in a decentralized manner. Technologies that either have no servers at all, they work from client to client, or technologies that can be installed inside the local network as sort of a small hosting scenario and continue to serve users in that network. So this is the type of uh, technology we've been developing. And this is actually what motivated the creation of the DCOMS project. Next slide. So the DCOMS project, which you can access on the website dcom.net.ua, is a collection of uh, servers 
we have hired in various Ukrainian regions. The initial idea was that should this town become disconnected from the rest of the internet because of military activity, people in this town will still have access on the local network to this server. And if we can offer good and useful services to allow people to continue communicating with each other, then at least um, not everything, digitally speaking, communications wise was lost. You know, at the moment, 99% of Ukrainians use centralized ser services to communicate with each other, like Telegram, like WhatsApp. And if there was no network, then these services would not work. However, we have built replacement services on the DCOMS project, and they are all accessible to you. They operate on principles of uh, federation, meaning that if you are connected to the server in Kiev, and there is network connectivity between Kiev and Odessa, you can also talk, chat, send files, have a phone call, have a video call with anybody connected to the Odessa server or to the Kharkiv server. Um, next slide, please. So yeah, the collection of tools that uh, we're currently offering include uh, it's a chat application um, called Element. And um, you can connect to the server via your uh, mobile phone app or via your desktop browser in the web chat. Um, inside Element, you can join existing public rooms. You can create public rooms. You can also create private rooms. All your communications inside private rooms can be automatically encrypted and not accessible to anyone apart from the people inside that room, not accessible to the administrators of the server, not accessible in plain text if that server was removed or confiscated. But by and large, it works like uh, Slack. And on your, on your mobile phone, maybe it even resembles something more like WhatsApp. So generally speaking, yeah, this is kind of maybe looking backwards for inspiration on how we used to use the internet with various ICQ and IRC chats, but recreating these for the modern age with encryption, with availability, with, with all the emojis you might want for the new age. Um, we're also running uh, the Mastodon servers and you can create your Mastodon account. Mastodon is like a decentralized Twitter. You know, it's another kind of universe or what's called the Fediverse um, where you run your social media, your posts, your groups, so on and so forth. Uh, we have over a thousand um, bloggers using the Mastodon service, including you know, civil society leaders, famous journalists, um, and yeah, all sorts of people in Ukraine um, are running a Mastodon service through this project. Next slide, please. So for about the last year or so, we have been concentrating on figuring out how to rebuild pieces of the internet inside an isolated network. So, you know, can, you know, get websites, put them onto BitTorrent quite well. Um, but if the network is isolated, what can we do? So we began a, a new initiative 
called uh, we crawl. Basically what we do in this initiative is we crawl the entire website of interest to us, every page, every link on it, and create a static replica of this website. We then insert this replica into our network. Next slide, please. So here, for example, you have a way to access to access these replicas via a normal web browser. You just need to know the, the URL. And you can see, yeah, basically what's called a mirror website. Next slide. But in the situations of internet isolation, as you see on the left-hand side, that is not enough. You cannot access this mirror website using a standard browser. So what we are working on is figuring out technologies with which we can bring these static replicas inside the censored zone and make sure that if people in um, Luhansk, Donetsk, Crimea get disconnected from the rest of the internet, we can then select together with Ukrainians help certain websites and rebuild them inside their networks using our WeCrawl technology and then using the Sino browser, allowing people to access these websites and to continue sharing them with each other. And the last slide, please. So how do we get these static copies into an isolated network? Well, the best way to go is via the air. Um, obviously, all of you have heard of Starlink, but we are not betting on Starlink inside adversary territory. So for example, uh, Starlink as a device is banned in Russia and hence is very difficult to bring into occupied territories as well. Starlink as a service does not broadcast itself over Russia. But the most important thing is that the Starlink terminals are quite easy to triangulate on the ground and inside adversary networks. It is not a good technology for the safety of people running these devices. And I guess as some of you have seen over the last few months, Starlink uh, is not an easy service to rely on because of the various uh, personality traits of its leaders. So we're considering other type of satellite solutions, including those which are broadcasting TV channels. Uh, we have various ways to use a TV satellite. And we know that there are many TV dishes all around occupied territories as well. And we can transmit data over television satellites. I won't go into a lot of detail on how we do it, but it's not a complicated process. It's something that has already been done um, in other contexts, in other countries. Uh, and there are various opportunities provided by satellite companies that help you move data and then help people on the ground actually receive and record this data on their, on their um, on the TV, TV boxes. And then we already have the technology to propagate this content amongst various users um, using the Sino tool and using uh, a few other tools, which unfortunately I don't have time to go into today. So just to recap, the three 
heads of the chimera of censorship um, that we discussed today, that equality is battling every day, is the censorship of or brought about by cyber attacks against websites, the censorship of many websites and many cloud services and VPN services by the censor, you know, the blocking of access to these websites. And then the censorship, of course, that can be implemented by simply cutting off the outside internet. And as you can see, there are solutions to all of these problems. Um, I think what is important to realize is that the new internet that we are all living in is going to be based on, is going to see more and more um, sovereignty or splintering. Now, we have already seen a lot of the splintering from the point of view of, let's say, co commercial monopolies, right? Facebook is trying to create its own ecosystem, its own internet. Google is trying to create its own internet, so on and so forth. These internets are not necessarily interoperable. You know, you can have an account in one and you can have an account in the other one but you cannot use your Facebook account to log into Gmail, so on and so forth. They all want to create their own walled gardens. Now, to add to this, we have the problems of governments um, limiting and shutting down uh, global connectivity altogether. I think this trend has been growing in the last few years and is unfortunately is only going to continue to grow. We have solutions for various instances, but these solutions are going to require your interest, your ability to catch up with these solutions, your ability to accept a slightly different experience in the future um, yeah, your ability to live without Telegram and so forth. So it is in one way a brave new world, but what we have seen very much is that the Ukrainian people are a brave new people. And on the last slide, you will be able to see um, some of the websites of what I've been talking about and the various ways to get in touch with us. And on the left-hand side at the bottom uh, on GitHub, where you can go and see the code of our work. I think I even forgot to mention this in the beginning, but one of our principles is to publish everything that we create open source. It does not reduce the security of our tools. You know, our security is not based on obscurity. It is based on good design, good programming, good mathematics. So yeah, we do publish everything that we do um, transparently. All right, um, I'm going to conclude there and I am going to invite your questions. Dear uh, Dimitri, I will uh, stop uh, sharing the screen. Uh, thank you for your presentation and uh, I'm inviting uh, participant to either proactively ask the question or send it to me. In the meantime, I will uh, read aloud the question that we receive via registration form. In your personal opinion, is it possible for Ukrainian state to create a decentralized network on its own? How old is the technology and how many existing technologies of decentralized network are existing in the open market? Yeah, good question. So first of all, decentralized technologies have existed since the beginning of the internet and continue to exist now. BitTorrent, for example, is something that everybody knows pretty much and that has millions and millions of users every day. 
Um, decentralized technologies have also received a huge push in the last few years by all the various cryptocurrencies. Cryptocurrencies are built on decentralized principles, on decentralized protocols. So yes, uh, <laughs> I think the question is, can the government build a decentralized service? The answer is yes. But the second answer is that the point of a decentralized service is so that it is not built by the government, that it is actually built from the ground up by the grassroots. Um, in theory, not in theory, um, in practice, you know, we did not build Element, we did not build Mastodon. These are already existing software, free software. We simply installed them, configured them, and made them available. The whole DCOMS project can be replicated, and we encourage its replication, and we help with its replication um, by anybody else. The only difference is that everyone is used to being on a network with 200 million users. You know, people on today's internet feel they have succeeded if they have, you know, 50,000 followers. The problem this type of thinking will have in a federated internet or in a decentralized internet is that, first of all, <laughs> you will need to detach yourself from the success rating of the number of followers because you will need to rebuild these followers. In a centralized service, it's very easy to find. Uh, you know, the center Hramatsky Svobod or equality. Uh, in a decentralized internet, it will be more difficult. Um, but actually, I feel that a decentralized internet is a lot closer in resemblance to our natural physical societies, which are limited by geographic distance, which are um, limited by language and by other differences. So it actually begins to rebuild this kind of society in a much more um, similar fashion than this social internet, the web two of Facebook, Twitter, and so on that we have gotten used to over the last few years. There you go. Sorry, that's a long answer. Um, Dimitri, um, thank you. And I have uh, three more questions to go. Second question, please clarify it. Mastodon is a tool of instant communication, communication, basically a messenger, and it's used by investigative journalists, human rights defenders, or it's used by ordinary people. And how to prevent uh, Russian occupiers of using such services in south of Ukraine, for example? So uh, how Mastodon uh, or anybody can become a participant of the decentralized network or is there some kind some kind of a watchdog okay so first of all mastodon is the blogging platform so mastodon is more like twitter element is more like the instant messaging um, that you were referring to and yes it is used by all sorts of people um, it is used by organizations, it is used by individuals who are professional or who are just simply home users. Um, in theory, if you go to any element server, the biggest one is called uh, matrix.org. So if you don't go to the servers on our network, but you go and register an account at, a, at another network, then yes, anybody can join the server, doesn't matter what country they come from. On our network, the DCOMS network, if you join the Kiev or the Rivne or the Kherson server, um, those servers initially 
were banning Russian IPs because we thought this was a service for Ukrainians. There didn't need to be any Russians there. Um, however, unfortunately, as the war progressed and Ukrainian territories became part of the RUNET, we had to rethink and rebalance some of those things. So what we have on our service are also moderators, people looking after the conversations, at least the public conversations, the conversations they can see which are happening there and are trying to find out and ban any provocateurs. Um, by and large, yeah, DCOM service which are in Ukraine um, don't easily allow Russian IPs to join them. Service which are in occupied territories, there's a little bit more difficult there because we cannot block the server from itself. Understood. Um, thank you for cl clarification. And um, uh, please uh, explain this uh, tool, Sino, which provides uh, mirroring uh, websites. It's used to support media freedom freedom of speech, and do you have a data in what countries Sino is used in, uh, what countries are in need of such service? Yes, we do have uh, data. I'm not sure if it's on our website now, um, but we have figured out on how to do analytics uh, of a decentralized network without compromising anybody's privacy. Um, at the moment, our kind of countries of highest usage are Iran, Ukraine, uh, and Russia, or the RUNET, um, with quite a lot of usage growing uh, in India, in Afghanistan, uh, in Myanmar too. Like I mentioned before, more and more countries are resorting to network shutdowns where VPNs uh, are no longer working. So yes, the service is growing in those networks. Now, it would also be very good to see just as much growth in Canada, in Germany, in the United States simply for the fact that if we have more users in these countries, these users become bridges for people living in highly sensitive environments. So we also need more bridges. I think at any one moment, we have around 2000 bridges accessible in the network. Um, but yeah, the more the better, of course. Understood. Um, thank you. And uh, the second question, can Sino browser protect our financial data? But maybe not only financial data, any other sort of uh, private data, communication, emails, chats? Yeah, it's a very good question. So look, Sino was designed as a tool to circumvent censorship. Uh, it was not designed as a tool for anonymity, it was not designed as a tool for secure internet. However, if you trust a normal browser to log into your bank or to log into your Google Drive or whatever, uh, we have a special option inside Sino to do this as well. It's called a private window. So when you open a private window in the browser, uh, everything that you do remains private to you. You're not sharing it with anybody else. You're not sharing any cache on your phone with any other user of Sino. So yes, you can use the Sino browser as you would a regular browser. Thank you. And um, the last question that I received during registration, um, uh, taking into account the data bridges, on your personal opinion, should the ownership of uh, big companies as Google and Facebook be split between various stakeholders? And what is the future of uh, such companies? 
Yeah, I still think this is one of the main questions or problems on the internet today. Um, if we were to look at the petroleum industry, it's also an industry that is dominated by a few monopolies. There have been times in the past where, well, at least the US government has led efforts to break up monopolies in the petroleum industry. There have been efforts led by the European Union to prevent monopolies or to punish monopolies, to find them. Um, it's hard to know whether this type of activity is going to lead to the breakup of big companies like Meta, Google, so on and so forth, uh, simply by following due process, legislative process. I think these companies uh, very well uh, structured and versed to re repeal many of those attempts. But at the same time, the move away from these technology giants is happening anyway. It is not a massive exodus, but people are definitely migrating away from Twitter to Mastodon. People are migrating away from Telegram to Element. So I think this is happening naturally. The biggest problem is that, you know, uh, neither Mastodon, nor Element, nor Equality have anywhere near the resources of these companies. So the user experience, the service experience that we can provide is not going to match the user experience provided by Google. But people are going to need to vote with their feet or with their fingers in the digital sense. If they are prepared to kind of liberate themselves from the clutches of monopolies, then they will need to be prepared to put up with a slightly different user experience. And it might be one that they will even learn to appreciate and to enjoy more. Thank you. And here, if I may, uh, I would like to ask a question from myself. So recently uh, in Ukraine, the so-called AI tool uh, chat GBT become available for users. And my uh, concern uh, is there is a risk of maybe a propaganda of disinformation risk for freedom of opinions and whether such um, AI search engines are beyond uh, influence of uh, governments do you, um, um, for example, what is your personal opinion on using such tools in the future? Well, it seems that we cannot prevent ourselves from making progress. It seems now that not only can any type of information be faked, you know, video information, you know, a photo, a video of a person looking like you, Roman, saying the things that I want to say. Uh, it makes believing anything on the internet very complicated, very difficult today. The addition of AI that can create legible, uh, intelligent, false narratives is um, impossible to prevent. However, if the AI is creating false narratives, it's actually nothing new to us, right? Because false narratives have been created by us or by people already. So this just adds, you know, automation and speed to the ability to create this information. What this might lead to, yes, is a general uh, rejection of any information by the average person, you know, because it will be impossible to know what to believe anymore, what not to believe. Um, 
but you cannot stop it. I don't believe. I think we need to figure out on how to deal with that, how not to become um, careless, how not to become uh, dismissive of all information as being possibly fake, or maybe how to become, how to build very good critical thinking and how to build very good uh, source checking into our everyday usage. But yeah, the network, the world is becoming more and more complicated and it's becoming more and more difficult to catch up. Uh, dear Dmitry, thank you for your uh, presentation and thank you for answering our questions. Uh, today we uh, have uh, we obtained insight in this uh, digital chimera, what you call three types of censorship of the internet, and you uh, give us uh, concrete tools how to work and navigate in the decentralized net networks. And uh, these tools provided is uh, extremely relevant for Ukraine after 2022 Russian invasion. And unfortunately, it, uh, they will uh, remain uh, relevant for uh, years to come. So I'm grateful for your presentation and I'm happy that your organization and your team also help Ukrainian NGOs to strengthen their capabilities in the, while facing uh, DDoS attacks from uh, occupiers. Thank you, and uh, we are finished for today. Thank you, and hope to see you in future. Thank you very much. Slavo Ukraine.